because uh, who reads online? It's more, you know, I can't read anything from the computer from my eyes. So that's one thing about university. We still rely on a lot of data. <laughs> Somehow we weren't able to. Uh, we don't need a, uh, the, the microphone because of this room, right? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's, that's high tech. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So Nicholas is going to be an extra student. <laughs> he enjoyed my class last summer, mm -hmm. sort of, but at two and a half hours a shot, it would be a little bit rough. Anyway, we decided we could just bend around. If all ten people come, we can just bend around the table, like one on each end, six on that side, and then one each on these corners. Uh, we should be able to fit in ten people. So every tenth person comes, please direct them over right here. Now try to stay in four. Okay, more syllabi copies. Uh, I've, I've set up the homework for the first several weeks on uh, four weeks. Um, and uh, hello. You want to come all the way over here? Sure. I'm going to say these three seats for myself. <laughs> okay. And uh, let's see, copies of notes that I'll probably be doing. I repeat myself to the other students um, over here. I make these notes for myself so I know what I'm going to say. And they're pretty much a recap of what's in the book. Skipping some things in the book. For example, if I skip it here, probably I'm going to skip it. So you can work it out like that. The book has lots of examples. And they're kind of, sometimes they're a little bit meaty examples. So that's, so I will be covering some of them. Do. And uh, three tests, and I've made them in class tests. So we'll, there are three days, uh, two days to vote on the tests. Those days have been specified. And then there's a final exam, which is the standard exam date in the uh, schedule. I think that's December the 12th. <clears throat> yeah, homework is 25%, all the exams are 25% each. We're going to cover roughly chapters two through seven of the text. The prerequisite is Math 381, that is an introduction to probability statistics with calculus. You might say, well, this is probability Math 381, but it's a little bit higher level, and at the end of the course, it gets a little bit less. Probably the last half. It's a little more interesting. Um, so there is some different stuff in this course. It is, I would say, definitely not a probability math. You can teach Math 381 out of this book. But we decided to make it a three-core sequence uh, rather than a two-core sequence. OK, so if, if it is bothering anybody that, hey, I've seen this stuff before, um, I'll try to bring in some additional material. <laughs> or research project or something. <laughs> Okay, you go. Uh, we'll set you up with a PhD. So, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, no, I'm not trying to be funny, really, because if you do, you know, I need some extra stuff in. Uh, there are plenty of problems in here. I'm certainly not going to be able to cover all the problems. And uh, I distinguish between uh, a couple of grad problems because there are half the students are undergraduates, half the students are graduates. So the way we usually work that is to try to make it fair is we assign grad problems for the homework. And the undergraduate's not required to do them. If the undergraduate wants to do those problems, I'm willing to suffer to the grade. <laughs> and uh, I'll give some credit. Right? Not like an extra 10 points or something. If problems are worth 10 points, I'll give them three or five extra points depending on how difficult the problem is. Okay. Something like that. Uh, there won't be very many of them. And then on the exams, occasionally there might be a grad problem too. Though the in-class exam, that makes it kind of rough. Um, you know, on a take-home exam, we can easily do it. On the in-class exam, it makes it a little more difficult. So, um, it may kind of meld together. We'll see, they'll find some a grad part. 
of a problem. How are we going to how I'll deal with that? Okay. Part G. <laughs> okay. And sometimes, I'm, and I have been known to give long exams, but uh, and usually I get some kind of practice exam. Okay. Help well, people get an idea of what's going to go on. <coughs> All right. So why don't we get started? Are there any questions? How's the syllabus going? There is archiving of this lecture. Uh, and you'll need QuickTime 7 or better, probably, to obtain uh, a good uh, business. What you do is to just download is the easiest method. Or run it in the page. They can run it in the web browser, too. They can walk, run it in the web browser. All I know is that I don't like to do it because I always, it just messes up my computer. <laughs> you will find a way if you want to. And there's the link on the web page. The, the, uh, the uh, my web page is www.uccs.edu slash tomorrow. Okay, and then from there you just get the first link on your teaching. That's a web page that has the long hair in it. <laughs> and that one, and it's a really old picture. <laughs> It was just when I was starting to grow my hair out again, about 95 or something like that. Uh, okay. So let's start. We're going to do chapter. We're basically going to do a, a section a day. And the chapter two is kind of review. I'm not going to go back to chapter one, which is uh, elementary county and so on. So let's just start with random variables. What's a random variable? Okay, it's normally denoted by a capital X. The author even says italicized capital X. <laughs> okay. okay. The author is pretty precise. But he has kind of an applied mathematician. So, what is it? Normally, the way you define a random variable is uh, is, is um, it's a characteristic. It's one way to say it, which means a function on a sample space. The way I like to teach that. is, I think, of the sample space is all the people. Some population. You pick the population. And then the characteristic is something like the age of a person. Uh, so each person, each point in the sample space has an age, and it's well-defined. They can have two ages and so on. So it's a function. So it's just a mapping from the sample space. From, you know, each person has your characters. It's so simple. So officially, then you have a sample space. Um, omega is the sample space. And that's the standard notation for a sample space, though. Maybe you've seen it in other books. Hi. Hi, sir. No, no problem. We're going to try to squeeze everybody into this room. Maybe we'll have to. This is probably the only day everybody will be here. <laughs> but. Oh, actually, in, in this back row might not be bad, too. But I'm going to try to use this board. How far can I go over? All the way to the end. All the way you to the end. You can use that one if you want. OK. So this uh, sample space, and um, I don't know. what The best way to describe this is we're really, after this particular first few minutes, we're never going to talk about sample space again, probably, or just rarely. It might come up. Well, what's an example of a sample space that we might construct by some simple things like throwing dice or Flipping coins and so on. One through six, heads, tails. Heads and tails. And so what's one through one three six? One, one, one through, through six. six yeah. Okay, roll a die, it gets you one through six. And then uh, toss a coin, you get heads and tails. Okay, so that's a good sample space. So let's say roll one die. This won't be exactly as it was in the notes, so don't worry about it. Okay, roll one die and toss one coin. 
And what are all possible outcomes? All possible outcomes. This is just kind of a refresher, so you get that. That would be um, the sort of all, well, let's see, usually you think of ordered paired, so it would be, uh, you might get a one in the tails, or you get two in the tails, or three in the tails, up to six in the tails, or then you get one in the head. I'm just going to organize it this way, 2H, up to 6H. Is it clear what I mean? And each, this, these are actually ordered pairs. Okay. But these are all possible outcomes you might get. Okay. There are 12 of them, obviously. 6 times 2, 12 outcomes. Okay, so that's the sample space. What's an example of a random variable? Number of tails that show up. Number of tails? Okay. You can do that. X equals the. Uh, Number of tails that show up in this simple experiment. Now, what are the possible values of that random variable? Oh, any, you know, any, any of the 12 times you're telling me you'd flip the coin. No, you're only flipping it once. You flip it, you roll in one die. Oh, roll one die. Yeah, so this may be a little confusing because it's easy to get confused. Okay, there's 12 objects there. Am I getting 12 results? No, I'm only getting one result. I'm getting when I do the experiment, I get one of these pairs, okay? Like 3T. If I got 3T, what would be the number of tails that appear? One. One. If I got 2H, what would be the number of tails that I got? Zero. zero. So the possible values of this random variable are zero and one. Yeah. That's the game, okay? So when you introduce the... <laughs> So in other words, it's a, it's a so-called uh, indicator variable. An indicator variable is any in the random variable that just takes two values, 0 and 1. It's a simple example of an indicator variable. Because uh, they occur so often uh, in practice, we give them a name. So it just, it's just happened because he came up with this definition of, 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 of this random variable. So I define it like this. I put a, you know, an extra colon here too. Say so that's the actual definition of the random variable. Okay. Then clearly it, it, it just for each of these sample points you can say what the value is, right? It's one, 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 zero, 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 zero. Okay. So if each of those points in that sample space were equally like, you would actually have probabilities associated with these two values. Right? There's a probability associated with zero, and a probability associated with one. What would those probabilities be? 0.5 and 0.5, yeah. So, so if, I let, if I now let A equal, uh, I can talk about the, the set where X belongs to A for some the set of sample points omega, such that X of omega belongs to A, okay? That's officially an event, okay? For some uh, subset A, I'm not going to be this probably mathematical after the first day, okay? But please bear with me on this very first definition. It's like, oh, it's a random variable. That's actually a mathematical object. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, for some A uh, subset of R, subset of the real line, okay? So it's all these symbols, yuck. This, is, this will be the real line when I need to use it. Um, I'm trying to save space here, um, saying that. And then, so I can talk about, that's an, so these are all possible events I might come up with. Uh, and for a more general sample space, it puts a lot of, you know, I mean, ah, events here are just all possible subsets here, okay? Uh, but um, and actually, I can't get all possible subsets for this particular random variable. I'd have to introduce other random variables. Okay, uh, because there's only a couple different events that I can come up with. Uh, what are they? I could talk about uh, the set where x. And generally, we'll say the set of uh, the set where x is equal to zero. That simply is the set uh, one h two h. 
3H, 4H, 5H, and 6H. So that would be, this is, this is an event. So here's where A is just the, the, uh, the singleton set, zero. Okay? So this, this is an example where A is simply the set where I want X to belong to. Right? If I go back to the, kind of the example of uh, people and their ages, if X was the age of a person, okay, then I might talk about A being the range 30 to 40 or something. 50 to 60, whatever they do in the media these days, okay? Right? You would break up the population by age groups. You would talk about the set of people that are between 30 and 40. Okay. You talk about the set of people who are between 20 and 30, etc. So A would be, in that case, the 30 to 40 range. The interval 30 to 40. Or the interval 20 to 30. Okay? That's what the A is. And here, A is just a singleton uh, point zero. Okay, so X belongs to the set that consists of the value zero only, means X equals zero. Right? So the set of sample points such that X of omega equals zero. So normally we don't write the little omega in there, we suppress it. Okay? But then they were talking therefore about a subset of the sample space. Okay, the little omega being the you know, generic element of the capital omega. These are the Greek letters, capital omega and little omega. All right, so there's the little omega. Uh, the set of omega, so, so, so then we wrote it down. And then, of course, we have the set of omega such that x of omega is equal to 1, and that's simply the complement of this set, which was <coughs> 1t, 2t, 3t, 4t, 5t, and 6t. So all you can get other than that is what's the set of omegas so x omega equals to 2. It's an empty set because you can't get any there, all right? And the set of omegas with x 0 or 1 would be the whole space, all right? So you could get only these possible, only these events coming out. Okay, these are the only possible. Well, that's for that particular random variable. Okay. So all possible subsets do not appear for that random variable. You see that? Okay. But anyhow, you have probabilities then. So now I have to add a probability. So now, uh, give it, let's see, what do I say? Okay. We assume that a probability exists on this um, sample space. Or that is given. Assume a probability it is given on sample space. So a random variable assumes that there is a probability of the sample space. Somehow constructed. We're not going to get into that at all in this course. In this example, uh, our natural choice would be equally likely probabilities for each of the 12 sample points. So one twelve for each sample point. So if you talk about elementary event, which is just singleton set subsets here. Each of those have a certain probability. You all have a probability course. You know what probability is. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, um, yeah, this is the equal likely probability. going to use parentheses for those events. Okay, I'm not going to bother using the curly bracket. It's equals one half. It equals six out of twelve. Okay. Equals one half. Um, I think I gave another example in the notes where we tossed three coins. number of heads minus the number of tails. What would be the possible values of that random variable? It costs three coins. And I looked at the number of heads 
that appear minus the number of tails that appear. What are the possible values of that number? Three. Negative one. Negative one. Negative three. Right. Yeah. So if I take toss three coins, I should write this up. Another example. Toss three coins. That x equals the. I'm not even going to write down the sample space. So you could maybe in your mind's eye. Right. Tails, 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 heads. Etc. Number of heads minus the number of tails. Then that would be the characteristic of the sample point that I want to write down as a number, right? So that would be 3 minus 0, 2 minus 1, 1 minus 2, or 0 minus 3. So you would get possible values. is a discrete random variable. And I think uh, we're going to refer to a random excuse me, we're going to refer to a random variable without reference to a sample space in general. We won't try to figure out what the sample space is. Because really all we really need to know is the probabilities associated with these numbers. What's the probability of a three? What's the probability of a one? What's the probability of a minus one? What's the probability of a minus three? That's all we're interested in. Associated with, we we're interested. So another way to define random variable is values and associated probabilities. Period. But we always give a mathematical one first. <laughs> uh, so what's a discrete random variable? There are a number of ways to define it. The simplest way, I think, the way the author does it is perhaps the best. Uh, it has the random variable that takes only finitely many or countably many values. That is, and actually, that's maybe not clear. So, what it means is this there is a sequence x1. Or I think I wrote x0, x0, x1, x2, and so on. And that may terminate. It may terminate as a last element, xn, or it may go on indefinitely. Is that okay? That I consider both cases finitely many or countably many values. The values of what's called the random variable x. Okay, the values of x. Okay. That may be only fine. That may or that may that may be only finally many. Well, whenever I use the ellipsis notation as a dot dot dot, I mean there's a countable. So that the probability that capital X equals XI is greater than zero for each I, for each index I. And also the sum of the probabilities is one. And the sum I goes from zero to infinity. The probability of capital X equals XI is equal to one. In other words, these values exhaust all possibilities. Okay, that's one kind of random variable. Both of these examples are discrete random variables. 
I had two possible values, zero and one. Okay. And here I had four possible values. Um, there's only finally many values possible. And that's a screw graph where I want to keep the countably many values possible. Um, let's do one exa uh, example soon enough. <clears throat> so uh, And the simplest example is a Bernoulli random variable. We mentioned that already, so we're going to discuss now. The Bernoulli random variable, some of this is just, uh, you probably had, but maybe you didn't have the, the names. If we're going to use this name. So the Bernoulli random variable. Is a random variable x with uh, take a random variable x taking just two values, zero and one, taking only the values zero and one, and then we have a uh, to describe all possible Bernoulli random variables, there's just one parameter, that's the probability that x equals 1. That's the parameter. Now, usually there's something called a, a, um, a probability mass function or frequency function. This author is going to, when you talk about the screw band variable, there's just the, there's the probabilities associated with the numbers, right, the values. And that's called a probability mass function. In other words, just what are these masses here? These masses right here. We're going to call that P of xi. I can, in fact, insert that here. frequency function, or probability mass function. This author likes to call it the frequency function. This just tells you the information about the random variable. It tells you the probabilities. So this is a very simple frequency function. Here you have the frequency function here is p of 1 is equal to p, and p of 0 is equal to 1 minus p. Okay, and that gives you the whole Unfortunately, the P has to be repeated here. <laughs> okay, but this is the function, and this is just the parameter. All right, so let's have, uh, what's, that's the frequency function. What's the uh, cumulative distribution function? Often the, so for a discriminated variable, the frequency function tells you everything. 
period. Okay, that describes a random variable. More generally, to describe a random variable, you need something called the cumulative distribution function that will describe the random variable completely. So the cumulative, just the general uh, descriptor of a random variable of any random variable, real valued random variable we're talking about here. We're only going to talk about real value. We're not going to get into other values. Um, would be that uh, capital F of X is a cumulative distribution function. You, what you need is you need a somehow a, a rich enough class of sets A to uh, define enough events that you can get all the information out of the random variable. Okay, so. Uh, that's the simplest one, is just to take A to be the interval minus infinity to capital X, uh, to a little x. Minus infinity to a little x, that's x ranges over real numbers. So if I take this A to be minus infinity to x, like that, okay, I can take it like that, then, uh, then of course, then the event that x belongs to A is simply the event that x is, capital X is less than the little x. And so then I get a probability. Right? And then obviously it's little x. So capital X is like fixed. That's your name, your characteristic. And the little x is going to be variable. Okay. And that's going to go up. So the, 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 this, is the, this is the percentage of people with age less than or equal to 50. Okay. Or the percentage of people with age less than or equal to 60. Okay, I'll, I'll make the, the uh, ages larger now, <laughs> consistent with my age class. Um, I'm not that old yet, but I'm getting there. Okay, so percentage of people, okay, so that's how you could think about that. Okay, so obviously that probability is increasing as x increases, and that's a non-decreasing function. Uh, and by the laws of probability, it actually turns out to be right. This is non and that you could let's see, I don't know if that's in the book in the axioms. I think it might be in chapter one. Uh, okay. So you might be able to get a little bit of background in chapter one. So he's got the axioms of probability. measures, the probably the whole space is one, all probabilities are non-negative, and it will fall out that that's a far and after between zero and one. Probably if, if A1 and A2 are uh, disjoint in the probability of the union, this is the sum of the probabilities. And then if you have mutually disjoint, a countable uh, sequence of mutually disjoint sets, then the probability of the union is the sum of the probabilities. So there's where you get an infinite sum coming in there. That, had, that fact that you can go to the infinite sum has certain consequences, namely that uh, 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 if I took an infinite intersection of decreasing sets, okay, then the probability uh, then if I, if I took if I took a bunch of sets I did a1 intersect a if, if a1 uh, yeah a n is in a n minus one is in so on is in a1 and so they're getting smaller if the a's then the probability of the intersection of the a n's 
the limit exists, okay, uh, is equal to the limit of the probability of the ANs. So you could do something like that that goes from one to infinity. So what I'm thinking of is then that would be a consequence of, of that axiom where you can take the infinite sum, okay? It turns out. And so actually what you could do is you could you could fix x here. Okay, and now increase just a little bit to like the x plus 0.01, x plus 0.001, x plus 0.0001, x plus 0.0001, and so on. So just make those are events. Right, then you get events, and as you take the point zero zero one, the point zero 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 one, the point zero 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 one, and so on and so on, these events would get smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So you have an decreasing thing, and then obviously the intersection of all those events is simply the event that x is less than the little x. So you'll get right continuity, right continuity at four of this function. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> And then also the limit of f of x. It's, these are things that are technicalities. Limit, and this is kind of a review day, so I'm going over them a little bit. x goes to infinity is equal to 1, and limit f of x is x goes to minus infinity. Just in case you hadn't had that in the first course, is zero. Okay. Probably not too many people discuss this one. Okay. As a constant, this, this is a nice exercise um, from the axioms, okay? From the probability. Okay. So then, so you have this. The axioms give you a certain function which has nice properties, and then you can graph it in certain cases. And of course, that's all they can ask you to do here is to give you an example of random variable and graph the thing. So let's take the Bernoulli random variable. Let's graph the cumulative distribution function of a Bernoulli random variable. It's on page two of these notes. I wrote a little graph just to familiarize everybody with that. This is a little abstract today because we're not solving problems yet. Let's see if I can move on a little bit faster because we're going to run out of time here. Okay. So, so for, it, uh, for the Q CDF is the is the is the Uh, abbreviation of that function, CDF of a Bernoulli random variable. I'm just going to do the general case, but you can think in your mind's eye if you want to, a little p equals a half like you wanted before. So this simply is um, f of x is the probability that capital X is less or equal to little x. And what's going to happen here, so that's the Bernoulli random variable, it takes value 0 and 1 only. So now I'm going, to, I'm going to work out some cases. What if little x is less than zero? Well, there's no probabilities, you know, there's no probability associated with that. So I get this is equal to zero if little x is less than zero. I could just say it's yeah, zero. It's, and then I'm going to say if x is between zero and one, but not equal to one. Let's see. Do I, let's have a formula for it. This is for the discrete random variable, this is the sum. Let's say I would do, how would I, how would I calculate the probability that capital X is less than the little x? I'd look at all little xi's that were less than x, right? In a discrete random variable. I'd look at all these xi's that were less than or equal to little x. And I would add in those probabilities. So this would be the sum xi less than or equal to little x p of xi. If I brought in the frequency function. That would be a formula for it in this group case. This pretty this formula is not so important once you see what's going on. So, well, let's just go ahead and apply it. If x is now a number between zero and one, do I get? Are there any x size less than or equal to x? Zero. Zero is okay. So I get p of zero is my sum, and that would be the only sum I would sum end I would get. And then if x is between. Uh, 1 plus or equal to x less than infinity, I get p of 0 plus p of 1. Okay. I would get more of these p's added in. So it's just more and more of the p's added in. Okay? So this comes out to be 1 minus p, and this comes out to be 1. And that's the whole picture. It's not very complicated. So 
So the cumulative distribution function is zero until x is equal to zero, and then it jumps up to one minus p, okay, at x equal to zero. And then at one, it jumps up to one. And you can see that the right continuity is kind of obvious in this picture. In other words, right continuity means that the dot, the heavy dot, is on the right side of where there's a jump. Okay. There is a limit from the right. Okay. And actually, there are left limits too. So that's also a theorem. There are left limits in this uh, part of the theorem. The right and left limits exist. Okay, so that. What is the left limit? The left limit is probably, the, in other words, what's this, uh, what is this left limit here? Or what's this left limit here? This height, one minus p. One minus p is, for example, probably that x is certainly less than one. That's the left limit at x equal to one. Because if you look, think about it in terms of these events, if I took x minus 0 0.001 or x minus 0 0.0001 0 and so on, and I take the union of those events, then I don't get the event that x is less than equal to x, I get the event that x is less than x. Okay. Think about it. Uh, so, so, in other words, I take it. 0 to 0.999 union, 0 to 0.9999 union, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I get the interval 0 to 1, not including the right hand endpoint. Okay, so that's the half open end. So that's why you get this, that's the left one corresponding. Okay? Okay, so that's, that's everything about Bernoulli random variables, obviously. Okay, and also a lot about cumulative distribution functions. But that's it's just a, you'll see some examples of, let's see, they print any copy of it. Yeah, there's a cumulative distribution function on uh, page 37. No, now here, he, he just uses a stair step picture. He doesn't get into this open circles and closed circles picture that I was showing here. He just does a stair step. So the jumps, actually, are the, um, for a discrete random variable, it just give you the frequency function. Okay, that's the height of the, of the step. Right, so this was 1 minus p, and this was p. This is 1 minus p. Okay, those were the jumps. That's all it is. So that's, now you know that picture. Okay, <laughs> let's go on. I don't know if you'll ever put it on one there. Okay. Mostly, he's going to have pictures like this with a vertical bar in this chapter, which are going to be the frequency function. The frequency function, that's, that's just, you have discrete values and you have the probability associated with little vertical lines. You know, just dots, actually. But in order to be able to see the picture of that graph of that function, you put bars instead of just the dots at the top of the bars. All right? You understand what I'm saying? The function of the numbers 1, 2, and 3. That would just get three dots for the graph of that function. The height of at one, the height of two, the height of three. So in order to make sure you put bar. Okay, so let's go on to the binomial distribution. What I'm trying to get through here today is just the standard discrete distributions of discrete, discrete random variables. So we have the Bernoulli, which is the simplest. You have the binomial, then you have the Poisson. You have the geometric and the Poisson. What's the chance that I'm going to get through all those <laughs> at this rate? I slow down to the scale space. Well, let's see. Maybe I can pick it up just a little. Um, what's a binomial random variable? You must remember that from the first course. <sighs> you toss those coins again? assume independent tosses, and it's just the number of heads on n tosses of a coin. Now, the coin we don't assume is fair in general. 
machine we may be biased so that p little p is the probability of x so uh, toss n uh, make any n independent tosses of 10 points Since this final grand variable occurs in so many different contexts, we also like to describe it in terms of independent trials where there are only two possible outcomes, success and failure in each trial. So experimental trials, for example. Um, you have N independent so-called Bernoulli trials because there's only two possible outcomes in each trial, success and failure. And then you're counting the total number of successes, or equivalent to the total number of failures if you change your parameter and so on. Right. So it's the number of heads of n-tosses of, of, of a possibly bias and so on. Okay, so there are two parameters, the number of tosses and the probability of, of the heads. So two parameters. The size. N, just the size, and P, which is the frequency. I like to call it the frequency parameter. In the long run, what percentage of your tosses come up heads? Okay? That's how you can interpret it. Okay, and so the frequency, the, the frequency function P of K equals the probability of X equals K. I'm not going to derive it. We're just going to recall that from the first course. N choose k, p to the k, 1 minus p to the n minus k. So here's the frequency function formula. k goes from 0 to n. Maybe we should think about this just a little bit. Because you have this is a notation for the number of combinations of n things taking k at a time. What are you familiar with that binomial code? Uh, binomial code. Sometimes indicated on calculators, uh, N C K <laughs> uh, has a formula N factorial over K factorial N minus K factorial. But for actually hand computations, it's much easier to write it down. I, I do it a different way. For example, um, five choose two is 5 times 4 over 2 times 1. You count down from the top 2 digits and up from the bottom 2 digits, okay? Uh, bless you. And so, uh, let's just say, what's 10, oh, 4, 0, 0, 0, choose <laughs> 3. That's equal to 1, oh, 4, 0, 0, 0. Why am I writing that? 1, oh, 4, 1, oh, excuse me, 1, oh, 3, 9, 9, 9. That's 1, oh, Three nine nine eight uh, divided by one times two times three. Okay, so you wouldn't use this other formula. Okay, because you'd be crazy because you'd be putting in uh, a one oh three nine nine seven factorial in the top and the bottom. You don't want to calculate that, right? That's a gigantic number. Okay, so uh, you don't actually calculate it to do it normally uh, that way. All that back so I don't think they did. If the calculator was programmed wrong, then you'd be messed up. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you don't want to get extra factorial. Anybody see that? In general. Uh, okay, so that's that counts basically. That counts the number of sequences of heads and tails where they're exactly k heads. So you could have sequences, for example, if you just had uh, three. If n was equal to 3, for example, you can toss in 3 heads and tails, then what's uh, uh, that, 
then 3 choose 2 is actually also equal to 3 choose 1. There's a symmetry in this formula, right? I can replace the k by n minus k in the same formula. And so that would be 3 over 1, okay? Just 3. That means that there's three sequences of Three sequences of heads and tails, three long, in which there are exactly two heads. All right. So the H T H uh, T H H and H H T. So that's the three you're counting. It's one, two, three. Okay. It's not the three long because that was the end. Okay. End was three. There were three coins. But the three sequences that had exactly two H's in them. Same as if the three sequences have exactly one tail in them. Okay. It's just three in this case. So that was kind of a trivial example. Okay. If I took the five, choose two, then that gives you ten sequences of five heads and tails that have exactly two H's. Is everybody following that? Remember that good stuff? You can remember all that good stuff. So H, H, T, 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 H, T, H, T, T, etc. Okay, they would have to mark down ten different cases that have exactly two H's in a sequence of five. Okay? All right. So, in a sense, each particular sequence has the same probability. That's how you get this. So, if, if K is two here and N is five, that's what I'm illustrating here. K is two and N is five. Let's look at this. Then, then you have to have um, a probability P for each H and probability 1 minus p for each t. So no, notice that each of these sequences, you'd have two h's and three t's. So even though you might multiply the p's and 1 minus p's together in different orders, okay, you still always get two factors of p and three factors of 1 minus p. So each elementary sequence here has probability p squared times 1 minus p cubed. And then you count how many there are. There are 10 of them. So you get 10 p squared 1 minus p cubed for the probability that they're exactly two heads. For n equals to 5 and k equals to 2. Okay. <laughs> right, does that make sense? So that's kind of a derivation anyway. Just make sure that everybody's on the same page on the first day. <laughs> As much as I can possibly help that happening. Now I thought I'd look at example B, which is kind of interesting. Example B from uh, the chapter. Just to go to the book a little bit in terms of examples. Um, he's got a single bit, single digit zero one is transmitted over a noisy communications channel. This is on page thirty-nine of your, book, your textbook. Sometimes I will refer to the textbook, so it'll be convenient. Do bring it you know, if you're not familiar with the example. But there is, because uh, I'm not going to go to the overhead and all that. If a single, a single bit, 0, 1, is transmitted over a noise communications channel, it has probability P of being incorrectly transmitted. So that's probably an error occurring. So if P is something like 0.1, that wouldn't be too good. Or even if it was P was smaller, but it wasn't small enough, that wouldn't be too good. So how do you, what's a method to try to, a very simplistic method, to try to uh, improve the, uh, uh, to sort of eliminate the noise somehow. So we're going to assume independence of errors, so that each bit uh, is somehow corrupted uh, independently of the other. And what we'll do is instead of just sending the one once, we'll send the one maybe three times. So in other words, you're actually going to have to use up three slots for each bit. Okay? So instead of sending one, we'll send one, one, one. And as long as then you get, and then you decode it, and look, if in that three bit space, you're assuming that everything's in lockstep, so you can actually identify where the three should be. Okay? <laughs> then, uh, as long as there's a majority, once in that three bits slot, okay, then you say, well, that was a one they sent. Okay? They must have sent a one because they were, okay, 
But if there were majority of zeros, which is why I must have sent a zero. Okay? So that's majority decoding. And you can go to, like, you need an odd number of uh, slots in that thing if you want strict majority decoding. So then, let's say, you know, do it with five instead. So you have one, uh, it's said five ones. Okay? As long as they get at least three ones, then I would say it's only sent of one. Okay? Okay. So that sounds kind of simplistic, but that's, that's, let's say that's done. Okay? Then what would be, um, what would be kind of the probability of um, getting the true message? Okay? Assuming we're only sending one bit. So the message is going to be one digit. Okay? Did we get the right answer? All right, what's the probability of getting the right answer? So we calculate the probability of a truthful decoding of a single digit message. For each of the cases, n equals 135 of repeated transmissions. Because I'm going to repeat that, that digit, right? I'm reading here on page three of the notes. What do you think? Follow that, maybe. We assume that each transmission is subject to error and reception with probability p. That's what we mentioned already. The digit could be corrupted with probability the actual transmitted digit. And we're going to. Is it kind of following? Any kind of following? I'm going to send. I'm going to send. Instead of one, I'm going to send a block of five ones. But then it may get corrupted to something like this. Okay? Noise. Okay? <laughs> And so this is what actually I, I receive. Oh, he must have sent a zero. That would have been wrong, right? So then this would have been an, uh, uh, a non-truthful decoding, okay? Of a message, of a one-bit message. Because I'm only going to either send five ones or five zeros. That's all I'm going to do, right? So what would be the probability that that we're actually getting the right answer. Okay, so all I'm going to do is say, well, each digit. I'm not going to actually break it down to you whether I sent ones or zeros. Uh, you don't need to do that. You don't have to figure out whether there was an error on each digit. So I want to need the total number of errors less than half, right? So that so let that x. The trick is let x equal the number of. This makes the problem a little easier to solve. Number of errors. Okay, in n uh, single uh, digit transmissions. Instead of okay, instead of breaking into the case of send five ones or send five zeros, I'm just going to do it this way. I'm going to take the case n equal five here. In uh, 2.1.2 example P. It's usually when you can sort of at least peruse the examples a little bit in that section that we're going to be coming up to, which would be 2.2 .2 for next time, maybe. They probably won't really get that far, but just a little bit. I won't tell you which example to peruse. <laughs> okay. That would help. Because some students have said, Really helps with Mara if you really read the text ahead of time. Okay, which might have been hard for today because I wasn't telling you that <laughs> and you didn't have a book to do. But just read ahead a little bit and that helps immensely. Just to, you don't have to spend like hours pouring over the book. Just peruse the book so to see what they're doing. So then and I want the probability that uh, an X is binomial. size uh, n equals to 5 and frequency parameter p and so then we're well, not specifying what p is okay and that's the total number of errors and I want the number of errors to be less than so a truthful decoding in this case is probability that there is x is less than or equal to 2. They're less than or equal to 2, so it's n equal to 5, right? So that means x is 0, 1, or 2. So that's p0 plus p1 plus p2 for the these probabilities right here. 
So what does that come out to? That comes out to be 5 to 0, uh, p to the 0, 1 minus p to the 5th. So we're going to use this formula right here. So the binomial probability is 5 to 1, p to the 1, 1 minus p to the 4th, plus 5 to 2, p squared, 1 minus p cubed. That one I just wrote down before. Okay? <laughs> and that's the probability of the truthful decoding. Which then you can simplify. I think I did it here. You can actually write this down. This is 1 minus p to the 5th plus 5p, 1 minus p to the 4th, plus 10p squared, 1 minus p cubed. And so I obtain, uh, I can pull it back to 1 minus p cubed, and I get some other expression here. 1 plus 3p plus 6p squared. The reason that I do that is just for, because I want to try to graph this function or get an idea of what it looks like. So it's one thing, if p is a half, okay, what does this come out to be? In other words, if each digit gets corrupted with probability a half, what's the probability of a truthful decoding? <laughs> it's only a half, that wouldn't be too good, but it's only half, because I get one eighth, and then I would get one, this would be three halves, six fourths, that's six fourths, three halves is three, and one is four times an eighth. Four eighths, which is a half. So it turns out that I mean, that may be obvious. In other words, well, there's, there's, because n is odd, there's an odd number of digits, then x less or equal to 2 takes up the cases 0, 1, and 2. How many other cases are there? There's 3, 4, and 5. That's exactly half of the cases. And by symmetry of the distribution, that's exactly one half. In case p is one half. <laughs> okay, it looks like it shouldn't be half, should be less than half, because it's only eight. X, two is only, it's less than five halves, right? It's, because it's half, it actually is taking half of the values of the nine case. All right, so you get this picture. So all the curves for this truthful decoding go through um, probability equals one half when P is one half. So these are actually sort of the characteristics of this, this decoding. Okay? The, the formula just comes out one minus P. Probably a truthful decoding is 1 minus p, in other words, the error is p, in case uh, we just send one digit and just go back. Okay. <laughs> so if p is 0.1, then you'd get um, the probability of, of a truthful decoding would be 0.9. Right? I think it's very best, it's probably 0.9. Now, if, p, if m is equal to 3, it comes out to 0.972. That's a little bit better. And if n equals 5, then you get 0.9914. So you can see all these curves, how the, uh, how the, how the technique works. So this is just a simple example for right, the binomial. I thought it was a true example, right? Engineering example. Okay. Uh, a lot of times you don't have the geometric distribution in the first course. That's the next thing. What is the geometric distribution? Does anybody, does anybody have it? Yeah. Tell me then. Oh, I don't remember. Okay. But it has, doesn't have to do with counting. It is has also, all this has to do with it was just flipping coins today, believe it or not. Isn't it like multiplying? So the, the frequency function is multiplying in it. Yeah. Um, it, has a, it actually has a geometric sum formula. We're going to get into the geometric random variable. I might have to say plus on for next time. That that'll be okay. When we get to continuous random variables, I'll go a little bit faster. I'm just still getting used to this room, too. You know, it's first day classes for me, <laughs> too. All right. So, uh, so again, you flip coins, the probability of P is of heads. But now, instead of counting the number of heads, See how long it takes to get a single head, the first head, the waiting time until first head, or waiting time until first success of doing those independent Bernoulli trials. How long do I have to wait? Well, let's say the probability of head was only 0.1. Yeah. Cool. Maybe you're thinking of error probabilities or, okay. So, how long do I have to wait until there's that first ever first test? Okay. So it's the problem, like if you were, you know, like if you 
So 10 was the idea. 10 would be the average, average time when yes. So like the probability that you'll get success on the first throw is like 0.1. Right. Okay. So let's take p equals 0.1. All right. So geometric ramp variable. Infinite tosses. of coin, probability of heads equals p equals 0 0.1. Um, x equals the number of tosses, including the last toss, until heads first appears. So x is greater than or equal to 1. Uh, values, uh, x equals 1, 2, 3, and so on, or k. Usually it uses k instead of little x here, right? It's a discrete event for, I'd rewrite all my notes. Take, re erase the little x and make it into a little k. <laughs> all right, k is a discrete parameter. <laughs> So if you get heads in the first toss, then you get the value of 1. If you get a tails and then a heads, you get the value of 2. So yeah, so probability that, that x equals to 1 is simply the probability of heads in the first toss, which is 0.1. Right? Probability that x is equal to 2, well, we can break that down in terms of um, events. Tails on the first toss, and then heads, right? I can write it tails 1 and then heads 2, heads on the second toss. This would be a natural notation for where subscription corresponds to the uh, toss number. And T corresponds to tails, H to heads. This would be an event, tails, heads. What do you think that should be? So that was the probability of that. Independent tosses, right? Okay, so it would be 0.9 times 0.1. Right? Probability X equals to 3. Equals probability of the first of tails, then another tails, and then heads. So, so it's only considering patterns, a bunch of tails and then a head at the end. This geometric ground of break. That would be 0.9 times 0.9. Times 0.1. Okay. Et cetera. So what's the general formula now? The so general case. I'm not even going to take this case. Uh, I'll take the general general case in other words of the B. So then the probability that X is equal to K. If I put the p here, okay. So it's 1 minus p to the k minus 1. 1 minus p to the k minus 1 times p to the 1, okay? k equals 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. Very good. All right. Excellent work. Okay. Yeah, so there's a geometric thing. So what's the proof of the... Uh, of the geometric summation formula based on this. <laughs> don't you use the. No. Go ahead. Don't you. Uh, like, oh, I think you say you. Okay, let's, I'm not going to do that. You just go ahead and you tell me what you're thinking. It's like, you, I think you like. Uh, you multiply by something. Oh, yeah, that's right. On both sides. Right. So in order to, to prove a geometric summation formula or something like that, if I wanted to prove 1 plus r plus r squared plus and so on is equal to question mark, I would say, I would call that, if I said that was some s, then the trick is to basically put r s here or something like that. r s is equal to r plus r squared plus r cubed and so on. That's equal to r s. Right, by multiplying over, by shifting it over, then you subtract. And that's the one equals s minus r s. And you get s equals one over one minus r. That's the usual proof. Of course, uh, we have to prove first that s exists in order to do that. <laughs> but nah, I mean it's not as big of a deal. But that's pretty much how it is. Here it may be even easier. All I know is that all I know is that. Um, well, if this is a good random variable, that's the assumption. It really is finite with probability 1. 
other way to handle it. I can't, it, it, there's zero probability that I have to wait forever. Right? That it never happens. All right? That should have zero probability. Okay, but that's the, that's going to be the hidden thing. <laughs> okay? And if I assume that, then I get the geometric summation formula, because what I have is then the probability that x is less than infinity, is therefore should equal to 1, okay? If and only if, uh, therefore, summation 1 minus p to the k minus 1 times p, k goes from 1 to infinity, is equal to 1, right? All possible probability. The probability that up to 1, right? Which corresponds to, if I put uh, p equals 1 minus r, just make it an r here, put p equals 1 minus r, okay? Make the usual notation. Then I get the, the summation r to the k minus 1. That's 1 minus r equals to 1. k equals 1 to infinity. All right. And then that simply gives a geometric summation formula, uh, which is summation l goes from 0 to infinity. r to the l is equal to 1 over 1 minus r. After I divide both sides by 1 minus r. And just change the summation index a little bit. All right. So, so there is, okay, so geometric summation formula gives that this is a good random variable, or if you assume it's a good random variable, you get the geometric summation formula automatically. Okay, so that's why it's called a geometric random variable. Um, and then there's an extension of this one, I guess we're out of time now, uh, called the negative binomial. Now that is a strange name. There's some really weird names. Negative binomial, you wait until the second success. How, you know, that's kind of where the time you have to wait until the second success. And then you write down the frequency function of that one. I it else too. And you get another kind of nice formula. Instead of a geometric summation formula, you get something fancier, which contains that formula. So I'll skip that for now. I'm going to skip hypergeometric random variable, which is 2.1.4, for this, for this review. And I am going to come back and talk about a Poisson random variable. We'll begin the next time, 2.1.5, we'll end that section. I don't think I assigned any problems on Poisson random variables, though. But the first few problems in this first week's assignment, which is due August 29th, I'm going to make it do it on Thursday. Is that good? You can ask about it on Tuesday, all right? And then, okay. You can ask in class. You know, on Tuesday, for example, you can ask before, before. You can ask now about these problems. And you can email me or whatever. But then after that Tuesday, I give all the official hints that there's going to be any official hints at that time. Okay? Don't be very recorded. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. So this is